when somebody is ready to uh, to try to get off drugs, they, they have those options readily right. available. And this will also help with our public safety needs because it's all connected. Well, that's citywide council member Sarah Nelson from the Seattle Channel's world famous program council edition released last week talking about her push to fund more addiction treatment in the council's budget. So where's that proposal going? What about other services needed as the city winds down the COVID emergency? And why is the city's redistricting commission wanting to split up one of Seattle's oldest neighborhoods? Well, all these topics and so much more on Seattle News, Views and Brews this week, your Coffee Break political podcast. I'm Brian Callanan. I'm a host on Seattle Channel and the views expressed here are my own. My co-host David Croman is a new dad. Congrats, David. Enjoy some time off. And subbing in is none other than Kevin Schofield, weekly, weekly columnist for the South Seattle Emerald and so many other great things. Kevin, I just wanted to throw it out there. Any words of advice for David? Just thinking back to those early days of fatherhood. I always subscribe to the idea of taking a nap when the kids did because nah, sleep yeah. can be very scarce. But any thoughts from for, for David, our friend here? Well, I mean, you and I are both dads as well. So, you know, we've both gone through this. I went we through this a long time ago. My, about, my, yeah. my, daughters, my daughters are 31 years old. So I have twin daughters. And my experience with twins is a little different than I, than most people's experience. I True. will say the one the one best piece of advice that I got It's one that was, Kevin sent in uh, not too long ago uh, with a fine bottle of wine it, right next to you. Uh, remember mom that? Mom and dad should take turns. Great I do. Uh, and you know, bringing up that very important point that, hey, it doesn't have to be You can survive if you're getting a good night's sleep you know, every couple days. Mm -hmm. But if neither mom nor dad is getting a good night's sleep ever, if you're both That's up right. every single night with the baby, yep. then you're all going to go crazy within a, a few weeks. So Makes like, you got to figure out a way to occasionally get eight hours yep. of sleep a night. Got to Got to put on your own oxygen mask first. As, as difficult as that may <laughs> seem, it's, it's an important thing. I, Kevin, thank you as always for doing the show. Thanks to City Grind Espresso, our background noise sponsor for the audio podcast. And thanks to all of our patrons for your support. If you're a listener, please do become a patron. Join at the $10 level, become part of our mug club. And I got to tell you, only two of these limited edition mugs left. So jump in and support some civic affairs programming. Our mug shot of the week. Emma, and Emma sent this one in, a mug surrounded by leaves in the yard. Yes, tis the season for a whole lot of raking as fall is finally upon us. Thank you, Emma, for your support. Be cool, everybody. Like Emma, become a patron at Seattle News Views and Brews on Patreon. Finally, a big thanks to Converge Media. The video version of the podcast airs on Converge Wednesday nights at 7. All right, let's get going right here, right now. Well, here we go back to the budget, Kevin. And as we speak, the council is in the process of releasing its amendments to the budget. We're going to see that this week. They've separated things out by city department. So at the start of this week, discussion on some of the perhaps less complex issues here surrounding Seattle Center, arts and culture, for example. But then we wrap up the deliberation phase on Thursday as the council listens to amendments regarding the Community Safety Communications Center the Human Services Department, Seattle Police and the Department of Transportation, some big ones there. Kevin, I wanted to break this down because we're gonna talk about redistricting later in the show, but this is the time when council members are really pushing for earmarks for their specific districts. Let's talk about what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, well, I, and first let's, let's just be clear. This is proposed amendments this week. True, right? true, they're true. Not gonna, they're not gonna vote on what what what's really gonna end up uh, in the in the budget for another couple weeks, you know, yeah. three, four weeks, something like mm -hmm. that. But this is the first week they roll out all their their spending wish list, right? Right. Of all right. things and and right now there isn't a lot of money to spend. In fact, you know, mm -hmm. by by tradition, the mayor spends all the money that's out there and doesn't leave like a mm -hmm. lot of money for city council members to, to you know, to spend on on things that they want. So you know, to to some extent, the city council has to either find additional revenues or cut things in the mayor's budget if they want to spend more money on different things. But this is a week where they roll out their first uh, sort of wish list of all the stuff that's out there and and. You know, it, it's it's a it's a political process, and it's, I think in some ways particularly political this year because we the seven district based city council positions are all up for election next year, right? That's so, right. Mm -hmm. And 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 the you know the primary election will be in May, and the general election will be the first week of November, which will be mm -hmm. before the twenty twenty four budget is done. Yeah. Right. So right. so what they get into the budget this year is the thing that they're going to be campaigning on next year. Right. It's a very so, good, very so, good way to look at it. So yeah. district, we're going to see a lot of district-based earmarks on this yep. for you know transportation and street and sidewalk projects, right? Or parks, 
for you know safety products. Just there's going to be a variety of stuff there because again, this is the stuff they're going to be campaigning on next year, right? right. And it, it'll be right. interesting also to see since we're doing this redistricting and they're you know ninety nine yeah. percent. And we're going to talk about that I think a little bit in, in yeah, a little yeah. while mm-hmm. later. You know when when we see uh, district based council members propose earmarks, are they proposing them for their current district or right. for the district they're going to yeah. have? Right. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. it sure looks like a bunch of Magnolia is going to end up in in District six starting district six. So district Dance seven Strauss's. right now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are we going to see the you know District six based uh, you know, council member Dan Strauss uh, proposing earmarks for Magnolia? Mm-hmm. Or are mm-hmm. we going to see, you know, District seven based council member Andrew Lewis proposing some or maybe he doesn't propose anymore for Magnolia right. anymore? Right? Yeah. What is the political calculus around all of that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's that, a split neighborhood right now with with yeah. the way the redistricting council has yeah. it. But keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we haven't yet seen what uh, proposed amendments are going to be for some of the bigger kind of high profile things like the police department. And, yeah. and you know, some of the departments like the uh, parking enforcement officers, the mm-hmm. uh, community uh, uh, safety and communication communications center. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Center. Um because those are coming at the end of the week. We'll see those probably yeah. on Wednesday, right? Right, this week. right. Uh, so uh, we don't really know kind of how much effort they're putting in that. But what we've seen so far with kind of the smaller departments for the starting, pretty tame stuff this year. They know there isn't a lot of money out there. Right. And so a lot of them are going to be, you know, kind of saving up their wishes for things they probably have a better chance of getting. One of the interesting aspects of how this works at this stage is any proposal needs to be, uh, have three city council members uh, names attached to it. So sort of one main mm-hmm. sponsor and two co-sponsors. And, uh, you know, so it's interesting to see sort of which ones are teaming up and which ones are, are not right. teaming up as, as they go through this, where there's some horse trading, you know, I will support your amendments if you support mine. Going to be so, plenty of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to see a lot of that this week and see where the, uh, you know, who's banding together to try to get stuff to get uh, through. Thank you for breaking all those pieces down. I wanted to shift gears ever so slightly here and just touch on what Councilmember Sarah Nelson was talking about at the top of the show here, drug addiction treatment, drug addiction treatment, I should say. She wrote an op-ed about this in the Seattle Times, noting that substance use disorder can be a precursor and an outgrowth of chronic homelessness, a contributor to public safety problems. So she's proposing a $2 million pilot program to fund direct addiction treatment. And I think this is significant, Kevin, because she's talking about treating people to end their addiction rather than the harm reduction model that most of our public health agencies are working with right now, using methadone, et cetera, to help people manage their addictions and stop overdose deaths. But what do you make of what she's saying? Because there was also a city auditor report about this too very recently. What's going on with this? And and the city auditor report, uh, which just came out earlier this week, uh, yeah. it, it is a little different aspect of this. So we actually have, okay. in some ways, two different uh, substance abuse uh, issues going on, public health issues yeah. going on. Right? One is around opioids, in, including mm-hmm. the biggest one, fentanyl at the moment, right? Right. Uh, and the second one is around methamphetamines, right. which are stimulants, they're not opioids. Yeah. Um, right. And and really, in the last two years, a number of overdoses around both of those have have absolutely skyrocketed. Both drugs overdoses, skyrocketed. Yes, mm-hmm. overdoses bo- both being uh, you know a, a serious medical issue in themselves because that's people dying from them essentially mm-hmm. most of the time, uh, but also sort of a proxy of the larger use of both of those. Right. So mm-hmm. opioids are, continue to go up. Um, uh, but um, stimulants, particularly methamphetamines, are also going up, and the treatment for them is different. So what the auditor's office was saying was, we really need to look, you know, let's not get 100% kind of tunnel vision on opioids. It's a serious, serious problem, but we have another one here, and okay. it requires a different kind of treatment program, of okay. which we have very, very little in King County right now. Right, right, right. right. So the auditor's office is saying, we should be working on making sure that we have treatment programs for methamphetamines as well. Mm-hmm. But, you know, council member Nelson makes a good point about opioids as well, right? Yeah. That, 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 uh, you know, buprenorphine and, uh, you know, the other, uh, methadone, mm-hmm. methadone, those sorts of things, tools. um, are, are good tools in some ways are harm reduction. Uh, and there, there's, uh, there's some debate about, particularly for people who have been addicted to opioids for a long time, uh-huh. how much their physiology changes mm. and whether they can actually be cured of it. 
And right. there's, there's um, a strong belief in parts of the medical community that after a certain point, people can't be cured of it. Right. 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 That, that they're not going to go through this treatment pr program and come out clean yeah. and be clean for the rest of their lives. Right. Right. That right. their body right. has physiologically changed to the point where they are going, their body is going to crave opioids for the rest of their life. Right, right, right. That's a big so part a, of what addiction a new is. Program, a methadone program, something like that, is something that they're going to be, you know, they're going to be using for the rest of their life. Reliant on, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not everybody who ever uses them, but but right. there's certainly a, a belief, again, in the medical community that for some opioid addicts, that is what their life is going to be for the rest of their life. So yeah, then yeah. it comes back to sort of how do we manage that medically, right? Yeah. Right. Is, you know, we, we certainly want to have treatment programs, as, as Councilmember Nelson is saying, uh, so that a set of people who have not reached that threshold point yet can get treated and get clean and be clean forever. But there's also going to be a set of people who uh, that is not going to work for as well. Right. right. But so, I mean, we can take the larger point from Councilmember Nelson that we need to broaden out the way we think about the medical solutions that we're providing for the set of people yeah. in our community who have uh, substance abuse issues right now. Okay. Right. Either okay. side, methadone, stimulants, or mm -hmm. opioids. Um, and, uh, and, and let's not just sort of continue to carry a set of people along, mm -hmm. you know, with, with, with the BU kind of maintenance programs, if we right. really can treat them. But right. overall in King County, we still don't have anywhere near the, yeah. the amount of uh, the capacity that we would need for this set of the number of people who are addicted to, yeah. to substances here, right? It's not, not even close. And I just see this playing out, and, and this is an old debate, uh, Kevin, that's been going yeah. on for decades here, this idea of uh, harm reduction versus some sort of abstinence yeah. type of treatment, if you want to call it that. And and I guess what Councilmember Nelson is saying, and maybe some people in the health community would agree with this, we need we need both of these approaches going forward. Is that what you're kind yeah. of reading here? Yeah, yeah. And the other you know, the other political problem around this is mm -hmm. that King County is the one who's supposed to be responsible yeah. right, for, right, right. For, for this whole space, the whole substance yeah. abuse treatment and, and management place, not the city of Seattle. And Councilmember yeah. Nelson is, is basically standing up and saying, I mean, what she's not saying, but she's mm -hmm. saying with, with actions is, you know, they're not getting the job done, right? Yeah. The city of yeah. Seattle needs to be, you know, stepping up and doing more on our own for this right. and yeah. not relying on King County. Now, King County, uh, uh, King County Executive Con Dale Constantine has stepped up recently and said, okay, we're going to sort of do some more. A lot of what he's been doing is throwing money at trying to preserve the capacity that exists right now, which is not yep. enough, but it's mm -hmm. under threat and a lot of, you know, and, and, and some of the places have been closing down. So a lot of what he's trying to do is stop the places that exist now from closing down. And yeah. he's making, he, you know, he said some, some words about sort of growing it, but finding locations for these places and in particular finding piece. this, finding the staff to run these places mm -hmm. because the, right. the people who are qualified medically to run these kinds of programs are very few and far between, right? Right. And they're right. extremely high demand, right? Yeah. It's, and when you and when you talk about at least, let me jump in here, just with what the city's going through here, potentially at least what the mayor has proposed, uh, not raising those salaries of those human uh, services uh, department uh, uh, workers or what have you. I know there's there's some well, concern about this. Just well, providing okay, enough let, workers to get in the mix here. I, I want to. Yeah, but let's be clear, let's be clear about that. So. Okay. Um, and this is this is a nuanced thing. So um, what the city council passed a couple of years ago right. was an ordinance saying that um, that workers on human services contracts, uh, mm -hmm. their salaries needed to uh, be have uh, cost of inflation raises every year. Tied to inflation. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. tied, tied to inflation. What the mayor's budget that proposed this year was because, uh, you know, an inflationary raise this year would be like 9%, 10%, yes. something like that. Right. He, he said, uh, what he's saying is, the and, and proposing in his budget is that, that that there's no way the city budget can sustain, see, sustain that sustain large that. increase. Yeah. So what he's saying is, let's smooth that over a couple of years. So we'll do, yeah. we'll max it at four percent a year. Yeah. But we yeah. will sort of 
you know, you can do the max out even if, you know, inflation next year is supposed to be kind of closer to 2%, but they yeah. get 4% this year and 4% next year and whatever they right, do right. next year to, to eventually get caught up, but no more than 4% a year yeah. just to kind of smooth it. So nobody is saying, and we're again, cutting. this is no, nuance. No, no. Yeah. Nobody is saying we're cutting them. Nobody is saying we're keeping them at the current no. level. They're right. just saying we just have to grow it slower because we can't whipsaw the, right, right. the budget every year with that. And, you know, the counter argument to that is, yeah, but those workers are getting whipsawed anyway by inflation, yeah, right? Right. So, right. And, and certainly, the city government has a uh, has more capacity to manage that kind of whipsawing yeah. than individual, right? You know, human services workers can do that, right? Right. And their budgets, yeah. So, and thank so you it's, for it's up difficult. That nuance. Yeah. It's important. It's important. It's yeah. just part of this overall conversation about providing the amount of people that are needed for these programs. And, and, yeah, and that's an ongoing yeah. challenge. I think we have to yeah. be, be real about yeah. that. Yeah. All right. We need to work on something up next here, Kevin, that I want to break down. We actually had one of our patrons write to us about this. Can the city of Portland pull off a plan to ban unauthorized camping on its streets? A new approach to a thorny problem for the Rose City coming up on Now Hear This. Well, we received a message from one of our patrons who chooses to remain anonymous as a supporter of the show. Thank you for your patronage. Drink, drank, drunk, a great online handle there. Uh, our patron was asking for a look into Portland's recently announced plan to ban unauthorized camping on public streets and move people who are homeless into designated campsites. Mayor Ted Wheeler says arresting people will not be the first option, but if there's someone who digs in and refuses to go to a designated shelter, they could face a citation. However, and here's where it gets a little heavy. That citation could be erased if people agree to get some assistance. Here's what Wheeler said. Actually waive those citations in exchange for services such as mental health or substance abuse treatment services. That's the ultimate goal here. It's not to penalize people. It's not to criminalize people. We want to steer people towards the help they need. Well, Kevin, there's quite a bit to unpack here. The mayor wants three city authorized campsites housing 100 to 125 campers in place before winter hits. He says he's got some sites in mind already. He will need some funding for that, though, doesn't have that yet. And there's going to take some county and state support. But I just wanted your overall take on this plan from our neighbors to the south. What do you make of it? OK, well, so there's a bunch of parts. Let's just start with the basic legal basis of this. A few years back, there okay. was this Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case, right. Martin versus Boise, in yep. which the Ninth Circuit said, um, uh, uh, the city of Boise had passed um, uh, uh, basically an ordinance Band. criminalizing uh, sleeping on, you know, park benches and sidewalks and things like that. And Ninth Circuit said, you can't do that unless you're actually providing an alternate place for people to be because right. they have the right, you know, they have to be somewhere. You can't criminalize mm -hmm. them just being somewhere they're homeless, unless, right? there's, unless there's somewhere else that's okay and you're willing mm -hmm. to sort of allow them to be there. So if if uh, Mayor Wheeler wasn't creating these additional, you know, uh, sanctioned encampment spots, then, uh, yes. or shelters, or however they're going to end up being, um, yeah, he yeah. would not be able to, to, you know, criminalize being homeless on the, on the streets of, of Portland at all, right? Right. And he doesn't, right. and he doesn't have those in place yet. So mm -hmm. to the extent that their current shelters in the city are at capacity, he can't do this. So he's got to get yeah. the shelters first. Um, yeah. uh, we, you know, I, I haven't heard yet sort of what these are really going to look like. Are these going to be, yeah. you know, we've talked a few times in this city and other cities as well about setting like really large tents, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. could Tent house, cities, you know, maybe. yeah. Uh, or just like the mega tents you see, like big events. And sure. Like yeah, that. yeah. Tacoma that could, uh, experimented that, with a few of those. Keep yeah. Going. Yeah, um, the places that I've tried them, you know, have kind of had a tough time with them. Um, mm -hmm. Locating them is, is hard for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, as Mayor Wheeler is saying, you ideally want them, you know, not way out of sight, out of mind, but someplace where services are going to be nearby. Yep. So either you need to bring all the services that homeless people need to those locations, sure. or you need to cite them in a place where they're close to all the other services, you know, sure. housing services, substance abuse treatment services, mm -hmm. all, mm -hmm. all those things, uh, schools, if, if they're a family, you know, all that stuff. So you got to have all this stuff together. And as we just saw with, you know, Pioneer Square and the Chinatown International District, the city and county's attempt to set up kind of a homeless services hub, 
yeah, in, right. in that area, right near where there's a lot of homeless people, yep. got substantial pushback from the community. Yep. It's not happening, right. right. So so he may say, you know, I've got some sites in mind for this, but that doesn't mean he's going to be able to actually get those things right. set up in those places, right? right? Yeah. And and so he's got he's got that issue around that, and then there's kind of the larger issue, larger issue behind that of like, are we just warehousing the homeless by doing this? Yeah, right? are we right. really you know is the intent really to to help them? And can they get sort of the services to scale? Is it going to yeah. really be any better for people in these mega tent shelter places than where they are right now? Right? Yeah. Is it going to be it safe? Out of sight, out how of much, mind. Yeah. How much yeah. police security they're going to need there? Mm -hmm. You know, are they going to have staff there twenty four by seven? Yeah. yeah. You know, all, all you know, one would hope that they would have, um, you know, clean water and bathrooms and sure. other kind of sanitary services there. Mm -hmm. They don't always set those up, right? In those yeah. places, is there going to be you know cooking facilities so people can yeah. you know keep and make food for themselves? Are they yeah. always going to have to go somewhere else for food? You know, mm -hmm. but, but it turns out logistically, these are pretty hard, right? Yeah. And yeah. the whole issue yeah. about you know like are we warehousing homeless people? You know, that also the, the the head of the you know King County Regional Homes Authority has raised the same issues about um, our uh, tiny home villages. Tiny right? house villages, know, yeah. Are we basically just you know sticking homeless people in sheds? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. right. So and again, out so, of sight, out of mind. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So so you know, it's not just a matter of like can we set up a place and put them there? It's like is is that actually are we actually helping them? Is it effective? Or are, we just, yeah. or are we just trying to move them to somewhere else where we don't have to like see them every day? Right, right. right. And I just, I think about this project overall, what it's going to cost because Mayor Wheeler did not have an exact figure on that, didn't have yeah. anything even close. Clearly it would need county, it would need state support. I saw some, at least from what I was reading, rather lukewarm reception from those different levels of government there. And even some of the advocates out there, uh, advocates for people who were homeless had some concerns about this too. And I I, I think that uh, it's, it's an experiment uh, that I think Portland is working with. Portland City Council is wrestling with this this week. And we're, we'll see where they go with it, but I, yeah. I just I think there's so many question marks around this, Kevin. Yeah, it, it you know for the cities who, who try these sorts of things, they are hard and they are expensive, and that doesn't mean they'll fail. Part, right, uh, Portland right, right, right. could be successful at doing mm -hmm. this, right? Yeah, but but you know it, nobody should fool themselves into thinking, yeah, we'll set up a big tent and it'll be great, right? It, it is yeah. really really hard and is really yeah. expensive to do these. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I want to track down a, another trend we're looking at here, trying to bring emergency mode to a close regarding the COVID pandemic here in the city of Seattle. I read about these two issues in Councilmember Lisa Herbold's newsletter. Letter, excuse me. First, we're talking about food delivery. That premium pay for food delivery gig workers ends next week on November 1st. Sick leave. That paid sick time for food delivery and transportation network gig workers, Uber, et cetera, that ends six months after the end of the city's emergency proclamation. So that will be April of next year, but at least the transportation network drivers have a new state sick leave plan starting up in January. And Kevin, this is just one of these situations where after two years plus of emergency mode, it's easy to get used to the idea of higher pay. And now it's going away along with other programs like some renter protections. So what happens now, I guess, is my big question. Yeah, uh, what happens now is it, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be it's going to be a challenge. And yeah. uh, some of the local politicians who push really hard for pushing a lot of these through are going to get a lot of pushback when they go away. And they have yeah. already. They're getting pushback from unions. They're getting pushback from advocacy organizations. And, you know, this is this is not new territory, right? You can look back at things like rent control, right? And one of the problems mm -hmm. with, with rent control is that for the people that they help, and they don't necessarily help every tenant or you know every person looking for housing, but for the people that rent control has helped, um, it's almost impossible to take it away, right? Yeah. The city yeah. after city and county and state that have uh, imposed rent control and and then discovered the problems that came along with it found that when it when they actually tried to take it away the pushback was so extreme that they got stuck yeah. with it for years in some case decades after after that right yeah. and and so yeah. you know we're going to see the same thing with us right is is, yeah. is um on, on one hand uh the people who are benefiting from the sick leave which you know and it's been a real benefit during the pandemic yes it, you right? bet it has people mm -hmm. people who have benefited from um premium pay 
you know, yes. for grocery workers, right? And again, it's been a real benefit for them. It's been a help for a lot of them, uh, particularly yeah. in the early days when, uh, you know, there were personal costs to doing this and, and a lot of personal risk for working in a grocery mm -hmm. store. If you think back yeah. what it was like two years ago, right? There were, yeah. there were you know, hazard pay was really appropriate at, at, yeah. at, at yeah. that point in time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But taking these things away is, is going to hurt them. Now, you know, the flip yeah. side of that is right now at this very moment, you know, Unemployment is a record low, right? Yeah. Employers mm -hmm. are having a hard time hiring people, right? That's so, right. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it may be that the government no longer mandates these, but a lot of employers who want to keep their employees are going to keep something like this in place anyway. So yeah. it may be right. that, and I don't know that for sure. I'm sure there'll be employers we'll who get rid yeah. of them at the first opportunity. But some who decide, hey, you know, it's more important in my business to keep my workers may decide yeah. that they're going to keep these in place. Yeah. Or maybe a smaller yeah. version of them. Well, so I, I don't think it's clear yet. I think there may be a couple of iterations on how this mm -hmm. plays out sure. once the government mandate goes away for these. Yeah. Wow. It's going to be interesting to see how our mm -hmm. local economy responds to that. I know these are all issues that are floating around the city's budget process as they work on ending some of these programs right now. So a lot still to consider there. And thank you, Kevin, for breaking those pieces down. All right. So coming up, we're shifting gears from transportation talk into a look into what's happening with the city of Seattle's redistricting process. We're going to tell you what's happening on what's next. Kevin, you and I have been tracking the city's work on redistricting for the past year plus, and there was a bit of a twist last week. The commission voted 4-1 to approve a map with seven districts, which we have, that keeps most of our neighborhoods in intact, except for Magnolia in the northwest area, which would be split between districts six to the south and seven up there uh, in that northwest part of the city. There are more meetings this week. Ideas could shift and change possibly. But Kevin, I just wanted your take on what the commission is considering here. Yeah, they're getting down to the end game here, right? And yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, it, for anyone who hoped that that this entire process could be apolitical, yeah, yeah your hopes are pretty much dashed at this point, yeah. right? You right. Know? And if, if anything, this is a demonstration that, uh, you know, of how Seattle politics works, right? Mm. That for better or for worse, small groups of advocates mm -hmm. can, uh, you know, have an outsized voice and an outside yeah. impact on what's going on. We've seen the the redistricting count uh commission get whipsawed back and forth on yeah. you know their first plan you know sliced up magnolia through the middle yeah. and they got a lot of pushback on that and they came back with the plan that uh kind of fixed that but uh actually kind of sliced up fremont yeah and right and now three, three, three districts right mm -hmm. yeah and uh and, you know, that wasn't completely unreasonable when I step back and look at it. And I don't live too far away. So I'm kind of familiar with, with, yeah. with that area. The yeah. area of Fremont that they proposed to pull into District 7 has mm -hmm. a lot more in common with kind of the Nickerson area just south of okay. the Fremont Bridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, okay. you know, the really industrial part of, of Ballard to the west yeah. of it. Sure. And the, uh, you know, kind of lower Wallingford area to the east. Mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could argue that way, but, and there's no perfect solution to this, right? Yeah. No so, kidding. so, you know, what they, what's now happened is after pushback from different advocacy organizations, they've unrolled most of that last change that, that, that they mm -hmm. did that, that reunited Magnolia. So they got to split through Magnolia again and they, they undid the part uh, of sort of pulling part of Fremont down into District 7. That's back in District 6 again. So, uh, yeah. uh, so you know, you, you can see them just sort of being pulled backwards and forward and trying to find out, you know, and, you know, as far as Magnolia goes, um, you know, there are good arguments on both sides of this, right? Magnolia, yeah. you know, as a neighborhood, is like, I think I looked it up, it's like 14,500 people. And it's a mm. big, big space. To, so yeah. to say, well, that's one neighborhood that may not be divided. That's, you know, that's really pushing that's the edges of credibility, right? A tough one. And, so, I, and I never thought that that really fit with linking it up with downtown and District 7 anyway. I mean, just throwing it out there. They're very, very different areas downtown in Magnolia, but that, that was the connection yeah. we had originally, and now we're dealing yeah. with something different. Yeah. And the, you know, the geography of, of that space and, you know, the connection to Interbay, Interbay itself is very different from Magnolia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you they're bet. right next to each mm -hmm. other. So, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, 
that's definitely one of the places where there's sort of complications. And there are a few other kind of t last minute tweaks that they've done to the, the map, uh, sort of putting all of East Lake back together again. That's probably the most significant of the other tweaks. And then just, just other kind of small ones. They did a few other yeah. places just to make yeah. sure that they like, get the boundaries of a neighborhood, you know, exactly right. And, yeah. and most of that stuff, you know, is, is just noise in it. But really yeah. the big one was Magnolia and Fremont. Yeah. And they yeah. went one way and they got a bunch of pushback and they went the other way and they got a bunch of pushback and they went <laughs> you know, back to the first way again. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's the politics of dancing in Seattle, right? Yeah. And, and here and, we go. Yeah. And uh, so, but it looks like they're really down at the end game. I, I yeah. wouldn't expect much of any change from this point on. They've got about two weeks before they need to get the map like officially right. approved. Right. So, right. I, I think I think they're going to be sort of really happy to be done with this at this point. Oh, yeah. No, they want to make sure that they do this and get it done before the deadline because the state redistricting process, you don't want to do that all over again. That was a that no, was awful. No. So uh, off we go here. It's time to wrap up here, Kevin. It's still baseball season. And as much as it's like watching a horror movie, I am still watching the World Series. Do you think the Astros are actually going to lose a game this postseason? Can they pull off perfection and sweep by the Phillies, too? What do you think, man? Well, there are a whole bunch of other teams, you know, who had completely dismissed the Phillies. Yes. Yeah. And, Don't and, knock them. Yeah. And I, I would also just observe that the Mariners did better against the Astros than yeah, no the kidding. Yankees did better than, than the yeah. Yankees did against the Astros. So, yeah. um, uh, you know, obviously, I think if you check the Vegas odds, <laughs> Astros are probably doing pretty well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would imagine. I would imagine. But uh, you know, uh, don't count out the Phillies. They're no, they're no, the, no. they're the up, surprise in, team. They're the surprise team I this year. It. I right. love it. I love it. I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, as a little kid, and the Phillies are my boys from way back. So we'll see see what happens if the yeah, Philly fever yeah, got, takes over. Here. Reese Hoskins is you know hitting homers all over the place. Bryce Harper seems to have oh, found yeah. his groove, and, then, MVP, and a little yeah. humility for that matter. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anything could happen. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Well, thank you, Kevin, as always, for stepping in to co-host the podcast. Much appreciated. And make sure you come back next week, everybody. Kevin and I will have a special guest coming on the show that might have a few things to say about redistricting Magnolia. Maybe a few other things, too. We'll have to see about that. Make sure you check it out. Thanks to everybody listening. It's Seattle News, Views, and Brews, where you can always find out what's brewing in local politics. This podcast is on all the big platforms. Again, if you are a listener, support the show on Patreon. Couldn't do it without you. Thanks also for watching on Converge Media. We'll see you next time. Seattle News, Views, and Brews is an independent production of Calaman Media Services. Copyright 2022.